another song, King of Kings, and then I'll attempt to uh, talk to you about what I think this passage means to us, <laughs> all in the light of the being sure of the cause. So, Luke chapter 22, verses 1 to 38. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, called Passover, was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparation for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be, and who would do this? Also a dispute arose among them, to which was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the cock, cock crows tonight, you will deny me three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it. And also a bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written among me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. Well, of course, 38 verses is a rather large passage to preach upon, is it not? 
So I've decided to take it in a rather different way from usual. I'm not going to start at verse 1 and move on to verse 38. We'd be here forever if I did that. So what I thought I'd do is I'd look at the title which I was given, which is being sure of the cause, and I would think, well, who has to be sure of the cause? Surely it's the people. And so I thought I'd look at this passage in the light of the people that were there at the time and try and distinguish a few different groups of people who might have been affected by what was said and what was done. And right at the very beginning, we see something interesting here, because the first person that I want to talk about is Judas, the betrayer. I'm thinking to myself, what about him? He was one of the twelve. He was one who was chosen by Jesus. He was one who'd spent three years with Jesus. What was going through his mind? What on earth was happening? What caused him to lose sight of the cause completely? For surely, having spent those three years with Jesus, he would know what Jesus' cause was. But he totally lost sight of it. But we have a clue here, don't we, in what's going on in this particular uh, part of Scripture within Judas. And we read in verse 3 that Satan entered Judas. And because of that, he acted in the way that he did. This immediately brings us to the idea that there's actually two things going on here. There's the physical stuff going on that we can see and understand, but there's a spiritual battle going on as well. And the spiritual battle was won in Judas against Jesus. A few years ago, in our home groups, we were um, watching a video series, and the guy talked about a downstairs agenda and an upstairs agenda. The downstairs agenda being what happens here on earth and the upstairs agenda being the heavenly purposes behind it all. And we find that these things meet here. That the heavenly purpose to fulfill what God wanted in Jesus' life was acted out through, G through Judas. Hard for us to understand. Now Satan the enemy did not know this. Satan, the enemy, thought, and we will be thinking about this through Good Friday, that he'd won the battle. He thought that this was a decisive battle when he persuaded Judas to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we look at it from the upstairs point of view, from Jesus' and God's point of view, this was all part of God's plan. It was part of God's plan that Judas would betray Jesus. It was part of God's plan that Jesus would go to the cross because on Easter Sunday we realise what else was in God's plan the wonderful resurrection of Jesus himself and all Satan's work was undone so the fact that Judas lost sight of the cause he never really knew what the true cause was but of course why did he behave this way? As we read here, he was persuaded to plan and to arrange the betrayal by the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Money may well have been part of the motive. I don't believe it was the complete motive, but I believe it probably was part of the motive. Verse 5 says that the uh, chief priests offered him money to find a way of betraying him, and at that time he was more than happy to accept it. But of course, Jesus knew all about this in advance. If we skip quickly down to verse 21, I'm going to be jotting backwards and forwards here through this passage and others. When Jesus knew what was going to go on, he said, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. Jesus knew in advance, even who was going to do the betrayal. Indeed, John's Gospel, chapter 13 and verse 27, says that Jesus told Jesus to get on with it, uh, told Judas to get on with it, go and do what you have to do quickly, because he didn't want it to linger on any longer than it had to do. So that's the one who lost sight of the cause, Judas, the betrayer. 
We're going to move out of this passage now and look further forward, and I hope I'm not treading on the toes of anyone who's going to be preaching in the next couple of weeks. But there are the ones then whose courage failed under pressure. And we read about the disciples. And again, we read, Jesus predicted this in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 31. Jesus said, then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. And he quoted a scripture. And indeed that uh, happened also in John's gospel too. Jesus knew in advance that they would all run away. And sure enough, in Mark's gospel, the account here, we read that they all fled from the garden as Jesus was arrested. One of them even left his clothes behind and ran away naked. And that must have been quite something, wasn't it? Not to be laughed at. So they were the ones whose courage failed under pressure. There was another one whose courage also failed, but at the last minute, Peter. Peter often gets a very bad press because of the things that he said when he denied Jesus, but I suspect that all the others would have said very similar anyway. I think better of, Jesus, uh, of Peter than that, and Jesus obviously thought better of him too. But nevertheless, he had to inform Peter that he would know that he was going to, to run away as well. The whole affair was instigated by Satan, as we have already seen. And along comes Judas to make the betrayal. Notice that in verse 32, Jesus talks about having prayed. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, says Jesus. He's talking about all of them there, not just about Simon Peter. That's a plural word. Satan has asked to sift you, all of you, as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon. I wonder why he let that happen, because he knew that his faith would fail, but he wanted to give him some encouragement as well, because he said, you will fail, and when you have turned back, then strengthen your brothers. So Peter already knew at the time of his betrayal, probably didn't think about it at the time, but he already knew that Jesus was going to ask him to turn back from that and lead the band of disciples afterwards. So we move to the one who didn't waver in his cause. Of course, that was Jesus himself. For he knew all along what was going to happen to him. He didn't want it to happen but he knew it was going to happen and he knows, he knew at the time that this was going to happen to him. See, he was privy to God's plan. He had read the scriptures. He had prayed to his father. He knew exactly what was in store for him. He knew and he didn't want it to happen, but he knew an unspeakable suffering was about to come his way. He wasn't the only person who had ever been crucified, but certainly as far as we're concerned, he's the most significant one. He knew that torture and death awaited him, something horrible, something that the Romans had cooked up to as an example to encourage them to uh, mind their own business and do what they told them to do. So Jesus knew that it was coming his way, but he was still resolute that he would be obedient to the Father, whatever it cost. And we have to go into John's Gospel again here. Chapter 18. And verse 11. This was after Peter had attacked the man with a sword in the garden. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? You see, Jesus was the one who never lost sight of the cause. Jesus was the one who, even though he knew what it meant and what it would mean to him, was prepared to be obedient to the Father and to go all the way to the cross. But John also says that Jesus encouraged the disciples too. If I can find the right page here. John 16, chapter 33. 
Jesus says to his disciples, this is still in the, uh, in the Last Supper, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Those are words of encouragement that Jesus gave to his disciples just before they all ran away. And they remembered them. And they took heart at them. And then Jesus did perhaps the most important thing that he could do at the time. He prayed. We have his prayer in different places. In the verse that the passage that we're looking at here in Luke, we have the prayer recorded here. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. He didn't want to go through it. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Even though he didn't want it to happen, he was prepared to go in obedience to the Father all the way to the cross. And then John tells us that not only did he pray for himself, but he also prayed for other people as well. Secondly, he prayed that God's will would be done anyway, we know that. Next, he prayed that God would glorify him. Father, the time has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. So that's Jesus' motive in all this, is that God will be praised and glorified, and that he himself would also be praised and glorified because of obedience to the Father. So Jesus prays first of all for himself. Next he prays for the disciples. This is, you know, I'm not going to go into any detail here because someone else might want to in the next couple of weeks. But Jesus prayed for his disciples and said he knows, what, he knows what's going to happen with them. He knows that many of them will not survive the ordeal of the Romans and the other authorities. But he would pray that they were given strength to undertake the work that he needed them to do. And, praise God, they did. He prayed that God would protect the disciples after he'd gone. And he did. Not necessarily physically, as we know, some of them were martyred, some of them quite soon after. But they stayed the course after Jesus' resurrection because Jesus would pray for them. And finally, he prayed that all subsequent believers would be brought to heaven to be with him. All subsequent believers who believe because of the words of the apostles. And that's you and that's me, folks. That's you and that's me. Jesus has prayed for us. He prayed that way in the garden for us, that we might be brought to heaven to be with him, that we might experience him and love him in all his fullness. So then, that's being sure of the cause. Just one couple of final points on this, asking a few questions there. Who are we most like? We've seen various people here, some who lost sight of the cause completely, others who temporarily lost sight of it but got it back again, failed under pressure. We've seen someone who was selected by Jesus because Jesus knew that he would come back and be prepared and be willing and being able to lead the disciples. Are we like him? We all fail, don't we? We all fail to do what Jesus wants us to do on occasions. But Jesus has prayed for us, and we believe that he will bring us back to him. You're here, so he probably has. Dare I suggest that there are any of us here that might have never wavered in the cause? Well, I think not, because we're all sinful people, aren't we? And just looking at my own life, I know very well that I've failed in the cause many times. But I believe that I've been forgiven because Jesus Christ has made it so. We sung various songs about forgiveness, haven't we? And we do that for a reason, because the people who wrote those songs understood this. They themselves have been forgiven. You too can be forgiven, and I pray that you will be. And I pray that you have been. So who are we most like? Remember that Jesus himself prayed for you. Remember that Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to be in you 
and with you. It's ironic, isn't it, that the story ends with someone indwelling you. It starts with Satan indwelling Judas, and the particular part ends with the Holy Spirit of Jesus himself indwelling us. I think that's quite an ironic thing, really, and I don't suppose Satan's laughing about it, but I hope Jesus is. Remember that he sent his Holy Spirit to be in you and with you, and remember that he will never leave you. If you reject him, he will accept you back, as he did with the disciples and as he did with Peter. That might be a message for some of us today. I really don't know. Be sure of the cause. If you lose sight of it, get it back again. Amen.